In this video, we'll review a few different types of imaging modalities used to look at the nervous system. For the most part, we're choosing between CT scans and MRI. That decision is almost always based on, is it an emergency? If it's an emergency, CT is faster and therefore the best option. If you want a better resolution picture, or if you're worried about exposure to radiation, then we go for MRI. The trade-off there is that it takes longer and it's a little more expensive. We'll start off by going over the ways that we look at the structure of the nervous system, and then some imaging techniques that we have to look at the function of the nervous system. We'll compare between those, and then we'll look at a few different uh, disorders of the nervous system and how imaging can help us identify these. So, as far as structure goes, it's CT or MRI. We'll start off with CT. CT is computerized tomography, and this is just a whole bunch of x-rays that are put together to recreate the three-dimensional structures. And the way that they do that is by spinning an x-ray tube around a gantry, this circular array of x-ray detectors there. So you can see that in the image. This ring spins around and a bed moves through it creating a helical image. And that's what allows us to then create three-dimensional structures. We can distinguish different types of tissues based on how well they absorb x-rays. Bone absorbs x-ray quite well as does metal so these appear bright while other tissues such as fat uh, or um, just cellular tissue itself, those will appear kind of a medium uh, brightness and then air and water are essentially invisible. So based on how fatty the tissue is, it'll be a little bit brighter. Now unfortunately, we're trying to look at the brain here and the brain is covered in a skull. So the skull absorbs a whole lot of the x-rays, and we can't really tell that much about the brain structure. We can see big things. There's definitely a big thing going on over here on the left, our right. Keep in mind, these images are always flipped. So your right is the patient's left. So if we look on the left side, and by that I mean the right side, I know it's confusing, you are right, the patient's left. We can clearly see some area that's a little bit dim in this image. Dimness is indicative of damage. Could be necrosis, uh, could be some perhaps uh, inflammation that's increasing the amount of fluid. Whatever it is, it's a problem. Fresh blood we can also detect. Fresh blood will generally appear bright as it ages, though it becomes dim. So we can see big things with CT, such as a bleed. And that's the most important use of CT scan. In an emergency, try to get an idea of what's going on under the skull. Now we can get a little better look by using contrast agents. The contrast agents here are radio-opaque, meaning they are going to absorb the x-rays and thus appear bright. The cool thing about them is that they only enter through a leaky blood-brain barrier. These contrast agents don't pass the blood-brain barrier, so we can tell where there are sites of damage. This is the same scan, but now with contrast. You can clearly see the areas of pathology by using the contrast agent. So these are wonderful. And again, what we're seeing is leakage of the blood-brain barrier. Now normally those tight junctions between the epithelial cells and the blood vessels keep stuff in the blood out of the brain. Unless you have a transporter protein or you're nonpolar, you're not getting in. In cases where we have brain damage, the blood-brain barrier is disrupted and the contrast agents can enter. So anytime we have an enhancing lesion, that means that the contrast agent must have been able to exit the blood vessel and enter the brain, thus the blood-brain barrier is compromised. This could be because of a ruptured vessel or just something like 
good old-fashioned inflammation. MRI doesn't use x-rays. Instead, it uses magnetic waves and radio waves. These are much safer because they don't damage our DNA. So, in an MRI, we use a, a very strong magnet to line up the spin states of hydrogen protons. And that's what's going on in the top here. So, without any magnetic field applied, the hydrogen protons will just kind of spin in all directions. Once you apply the magnetic wave, it orients them, in this case, in the z-axis. So that's the M-O, the magnetic uh, vector that's created. Then what we do is apply radio frequency pulses to misalign the spin state. So we knock them off the axis. The magnetic field is still there, so they will eventually return. And that's what we're looking at in an MRI. So on the bottom, you can see everything's aligned. They're all pointing in the z-axis. They apply a radio frequency pulse. Bam, knocks them into the y. And then over time, they'll come back to z. This decay is fitted with an exponential function that has two time components, t1 and t2. I have great news for you. You can forget what I just said. What's more important here is what do these look like? Unless you're going to be working on these instruments or designing new MRI uh, technology, you don't really need to know the details. But you do need to know whether it's a T1 or T2 image. And that's very easy to tell. Okay, so here we're looking at the decay. In T1, what we're looking at is re-establishing that orientation with the magnetic vector. So we're going to see an increase in signal over time. This is much faster in tissues that are fatty than in water-rich tissues. So fat will appear brighter, and then water-rich areas will appear darker. In T1, thus white matter will be white, and gray matter will be gray. So T1 is great for looking at structure. T2, let's have a look at those. In this case, we're looking at the loss of that Y orientation. So we apply the, the radio pulse, it knocks the spin state over, that's the signal that we're measuring. And so that will eventually be lost over time. That's again much faster in fatty tissues. So in T2, white matter appears dark because the relaxation is much faster in fatty tissues than in water. Okay, let's see an example. Okay, here we're looking at four different images and this will show us the four different types of MRI that we're looking at. Um, this person has Rosei Dorfman disease, which is a rare disorder where white blood cells form these benign lumps. And sometimes those benign lumps aren't so benign, they actually migrate into other tissues, and that's what we're seeing here. So, a little bump on the scalp that migrated into the skull. So, T1 MRI. What we're looking for is which image shows me white matter that's white and gray matter that's gray. That's clearly B and C. The difference between B and C is the application of a contrast agent. And those contrast agents are going to appear very bright. Those are again going to show us areas where we have blood-brain barrier permeabilization. So same thing as a CT scan, just looks a whole heck of a lot better. So B is T1 MRI, uh, C is T1 MRI with contrast. So that leaves us with A and D. That's clearly T2 MRI. So in T2, the white matter is going to be dark, gray matter is going to be gray, and fluid is going to be very bright. That's a gift and a curse. Look in D. The brightest thing here are the ventricles and the fluid surrounding the brain in the subarachnoid space. But that's the least interesting part of the image. We can definitely see something going on in the, the, the right occipital lobe, of course, our left is the, the patient's right. But those ventricles, I mean, I just can't stop looking at them. I don't know about you. Luckily, we have something called T2 flare, which is fluid attenuated inverted recovery. What that means is we take the signal from free fluid and we subtract it out. That's what we're looking at in panel A.
Panel A shows us the clearest image of the, the area of pathology. We can clearly see that inflammation in the right occipital lobe. You know what we don't see anymore? The ventricles. Who cares about them? It's just a bunch of free uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So we subtract that out in T2 flare. Still, in T2 flare, the white matter is going to be dark and the gray matter is going to be lighter. That's the easiest way to tell T1 and T2. We use T1 more so to look for structure as a result because things look like they do in real life. We use T2 to look for pathology because it really highlights inflammation. So we can clearly see that in panel A, a large area of inflammation. Panel C is showing us we do have a little bit of blood-brain barrier permeabilization. It's not in the same areas where we see inflammation, so the pathology is much larger than the contrast agent would indicate. So, C2, I'm sorry, CT versus MRI. CT, much faster. So I think of CT as quick and dirty. Dirty because it uses radiation. And that's, of course, not without risk. But it's quick. In several minutes, you can have a picture of what's going on. And this is really important in emergent situations. MRI takes longer, but looks a lot better. Of course, everything comes at a cost. So MRI is going to be more expensive as a result. So it might be worth it to wait and pay for a better resolution image. Most commonly what you'll see is CT, then MRI, whether it's an emergency or not. It probably comes back to this. Alrighty, how about function? So with function, we can still use MRI, but we also have a couple other tricks where we can look for uh, where radioactive ligands bind, and that's going to be PET and SPECT. So, Functional MRI, or fMRI, really looks for changes in blood oxygenation. That's why it's also called blood oxygenation level dependent, or BOLD MRI. They are all the same thing. BOLD MRI, fMRI, same thing. As I've said many times, we just like to name things. It's just fun to call things multiple names. So, what we're looking at with fMRI is not really neuronal activity we're looking at the ratio of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. That doesn't sound as cool. So we say it's functional MRI, we're looking at brain function. Not really, we're looking at blood flow as a proxy for brain function. Ideally, these go together. If there's an overt change in neuronal activity, we'll see a change in blood flow. So when neurons are more active, that activity triggers vasodilation. Of course, not that extreme. So when neurons are active, we get vasodilation, we get an increase in blood flow. Now you might be thinking, in the area where we have increased activity, we're going to see a decrease in oxyhemoglobin. No, we're going to see an increase because we increase blood flow. Yes, we're going to use up glucose and oxygen, but we're overwhelming the system with that vasodilation. So vasodilation increases uh, our oxyhemoglobin levels, and so we get a brighter signal in our T2 MRI, but really we're going to rename this, of course, and call it fMRI. So, of course, when neurons are active, they have many tricks in their bag, many ways of increasing blood flow. It could be directly because of the potassium release during the action potentials, and I'm not really going to walk through this. I'm kidding. I just thought you might want to see this again. Maybe you missed it. Of course, it might be also astrocytes detecting neuronal activity. Remember, astrocytes line blood vessels, so they play a role too. What they do, it's all that magical stuff that we talked about last semester. Either way, when neurons are active, there should be some change in blood flow. Now, here's the issue. We don't know which neurons are more active. And generally, in brain regions, we have two types of neurons. We've got local circuit, which are often inhibitory, and then we've got our projection neurons. They go somewhere else. 
This is just some brain region of interest. Maybe the amygdala or well, anywhere else. So, which neuron is creating the change in blood flow? Is it the inhibitory neurons? If so, then we actually have a decrease in output. What if it's the projection neurons? Well, then we have an increase in output. What if we have a scenario where we started off initially the inhibitory neurons were active and then later they stopped being active and the excitatory neurons were active but there was no net change in the amount of activity. This one was firing at 10 hertz so 10 action potentials per second then it stopped doing it and this one started firing it at 10 hertz. That's a polar opposite level of activity. In one case it's silent. In the other, it's communicating to its downstream target. There's no change in overall activity and there won't be a change in blood flow. So, with fMRI, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because you don't see a change in blood flow doesn't mean that there wasn't a change in activity. And just because you see a change in blood flow, it doesn't mean that that area is any more active. It might actually be inhibited a whole heck of a lot more. So it's actually less active. So it's nice, but keep in mind, fMRI is notoriously unreliable. The findings in one study are rarely replicated in another, with one good exception that we'll get to at the end of this talk. I know we're all thinking about the end of this. So we have uh, some other options for looking at function. Rather than looking at the activity of neurons or really blood flow, we can look at the abundance of proteins. And this can give us some idea of what's going on functionally. Positron emission tomography is one way of doing this. Between PET and SPECT, PET has better resolution. So what we're going to do in this case is apply some radioactive ligands. These are blood-brain barrier permeable, so we'll inject it peripherally, it'll cross the blood-brain barrier, and it'll stick to something. Now, it's important that it's not biologically active. We don't want to go turning on or turning off neurotransmitter receptors, but we do want the radio ligand to stick and then spit out radioactivity to tell us about how much of that protein is in the brain. So we inject this radioactive ligand, it's going to go into the brain and it's going to stick and what's going to happen is it's going to, it's going to release positrons and those positrons uh, interact with electrons and when they collide they then release gamma ray photons. Gamma rays are of course highly radioactive so there are some risks here just like in CT. But we can detect them and we can get a somewhat okay picture of about how much protein is in the brain. The protein that we're looking at in this case is D2 class dopamine receptors. On the left we can see control signals. These are highlighting the caudate nucleus. So you get your typical comma shape for the caudate. On the right, we see abusers of cocaine on top and meth on bottom. And what you'll notice is that the D2 dopamine receptor levels picked up by PET are much lower, telling us they have lower levels of dopamine receptors. And that's just homeostasis, shown very expensively. Now you might be looking at that and thinking, that's not that great of an image. Just wait. How's that for you? SPECT imaging is even worse. SPECT is single photon emission computed tomography. Here's why it's worse. It's a trade-off. So we're doing basically the same thing. We're going to inject some radioactive tracers. They'll go through the blood, cross the blood-brain barrier, stick to something and hopefully not turn it on or off. But we're using different radioactive atoms. Whereas PET uses the smaller atoms, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, 
those small atoms are less stable and so they more rapidly decay. That's a good thing from a signal standpoint because they emit a whole lot more gamma rays so the image looks better. Spect ligands use the larger atoms, iodine, xenon. These don't decay as readily. So we get shittier images. Just that simple. Lower resolution images because we're not spitting out as much radiation. This is a good thing though from shelf life, from the shelf life standpoint. You can actually order spect ligands and have them shipped to you. You can't do that with pet ligands. The half-life is somewhere between 20 minutes to an hour and a half. So you're going to have to synthesize those on hand. But even though spec doesn't look quite as good, we can still clearly see asymmetry here. In this case, we're not looking at dopamine receptors, we're looking at dopamine transporters. And what you'll notice is that on top, it's a whole lot lighter. We lose that tail of the caudate, and all we're left with is the head. So you can see this asymmetry. And what that tells us is that we have a decrease in dopamine transporters on, of course, the left side. That tells us we're dealing with Parkinson's disease. On the bottom, similar clinical symptoms, but no decrease in dopamine transporter, telling us we're not dealing with Parkinson's disease in this case, but one of those many other problems uh, that can affect the basal ganglia, such as multiple systems atrophy or something like that. So while it may be a little ugly, it still gets the job done. Now, which of these should we use? Well, if we want to try to estimate neuronal activity, fMRI is pretty good for that. It's certainly not perfect. But I, I think it's better than nothing. I think we can say that pretty confidently. Now, do you want to look at the abundance of some protein to try to say whether or not certain neuronal populations are degenerating, like in Parkinson's disease? Well, in that case, PET and SPECT are your best choices. They are not fMRI. When would you use PET? whenever it's available. The issue is that it's not always available because it's way more expensive to get the detection system. So we're looking at about two million dollars instead of half a million dollars for SPECT. And you must have the scintillator on site to synthesize your radioactive ligands. They only last for about half an hour to an hour and a half. So you gotta spend another two and a half or six million dollars so you can actually make the ligands. So, SPECT is probably more commonly used, PET, better images. Everything's a trade-off. And whenever we're choosing between these, we've got to think, well, what do I need to know? Uh, what's safe for the patient? How much does it cost in terms of time and money? So let's compare then CT, MRI, PET, and SPECT. So as far as radiation risk goes, MRI wins, hands down. We're not using any ionizing radiation. We are in CT and PET and SPECT imaging. Now, the typical dose in a CT scan is about 10 millisieverts. And this um, translates to about a 1 in 2,000 risk of developing a fatal cancer. So for every 2,000 CT scans, one person will eventually develop a fatal cancer as a result. It's not a whole lot, especially considering how common fatal cancers are in the population, but given the fact that we uh, carry out millions of CT scans every year, from a population standpoint, CT scans account for somewhere between 1 and 2% of all fatal cancers every year. Somewhere around, oh, 30,000 or so. So, to the individual, very little risk. What do you got, a 0.2% chance? That's not much. But we're doing a lot of these. So we'll actually kill thousands of people every year as a result. As far as contrast agents go, they're a little better for MRI, but they're mostly um, safe for CT, so no real big difference there. Um, mag the magnetic field is unique to MRI, so that's both a strength and a weakness. If 
If you have people who have metal implants, for example, well, you can't put them through an MRI. It's going to rip the implant out. So, MRI is contraindicated for anyone who has metal implants or any various tattoos that might react to the magnet. As far as time goes, CT is the clear winner. Quick and dirty, that's what you should think for CT. You can get it quickly and it's pretty cheap. The risk you have there, well, the image doesn't look that good and then you have you know, a 0.2% chance of a, of a fatal cancer. Okay, not great. MRI, a little more costly, takes a little bit longer. Pet inspect, most expensive, takes the longest. Of course, all these figures, I should say, are from about 10 years ago in Massachusetts, but I can't imagine things have gotten cheaper. Relatively speaking, CT is still the cheapest. All right, let's have a look at some specific conditions and see how imaging can help us distinguish these and see what's going on. As far as stroke goes, CT is the first line for imaging. The most important distinction that we can make is, is it an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke? Because our treatment is going to depend on which type of stroke it is. If it's ischemic, blood thinners. We want to restore blood flow. Hemorrhagic, blood thinners would make the condition worse. So we need to know quickly what's going on. CT is your best option. And CT will pick out fresh blood. It'll appear bright. So if we have a look in these images over here, the one on the left is clearly ischemia. We don't see any signs of fresh blood here. Look on the right, you can clearly see a hematoma on our left, patient's right. And again, time is of the essence. So CT is definitely what we want here. We don't want to wait for the MRI. We don't need good resolution. We can tell if there's a big bleed, and that's all we need to know. When it comes to emergency situations, such as a blow to the head, again, it's all about CT, quick and dirty. You can use MRI, though, to, to tell differences in intracranial pressure, but CT should be used in emergencies. Here are two examples where we can see clear signs of elevated intracranial pressure. What we're looking for is some shift in midline. So I've drawn a red dotted line there to show you midline. On the left there, 87-year-old female post-fall, we can clearly see that we're smashing the ventricles over to her right, our left, we clearly have a shift in midline. You might also see enlargement of the ventricles. We're not seeing that in these two examples, but you could see it, for example, with hydrocephalus. On the right, now we're seeing a shift in midline because of some uh, hematoma there. So this is after a motor vehicle accident, shifting to patient's left, our right. But that shift from midline is telling us we have an increase in intracranial pressure. As far as cancer imaging goes, well, we don't want to use CT. Not unless we have to. CT, again, carries the risk of developing fatal cancers. And we're here because of cancer. Let's not introduce additional cancer risk. So MRI is really what we want to use. And with cancer, there's going to be follow-up imaging. Anytime you're dealing with follow-up imaging, or you want to have a good resolution image, you want to go with MRI. And we want both of those things in this case. All right, let's have a look at these images. First of all, let's think, is it T1 or T2 MRI? Well, which one looks like a typical brain? The one on the right. The white matter's white. Gray matter's gray. The brain on the left, the white matter's dark. The gray matter's light. That's clearly T2. And what we can see here is within the white matter, also where the big arrows are pointing, we have hyperintensity in T2. That tells us inflammation, some kind of pathology there. Over there on the T1 weighted MRI on the right, in panel B, we can see clear disorganization in the white matter. We're clearly dealing with some kind of tumor. Right? It's disorganized the white matter. It's not forming white matter anymore. It's forming cancer tissue. When they followed up two months later in this gentleman, now we can see clear signs of worsening. So that inflammation that we see in the T2 MRI, of course, T2 flare, 
that inflammation is now spread. It's much bigger. If we do our T1 MRI with contrast, we can see clear signs of enhancing lesions. That tells us we have permeabilization of the blood-brain barrier. This condition is only getting worse. But we want to use MRI with cancer. Unless we can. Again, if people have an implant, can't use MRI, so in this case, they use CT. Now we can see CT without and with contrast on the left and the right. We can clearly see the hypo-intense lesion on our left, the patient's right. It doesn't enhance, though, with contrast. This is a good thing. This tells us that the blood-brain barrier is still intact, so it's not as severe of a lesion. Still something we want to take care of but much better to see non-enhancing lesions. Again, cancer is going to involve multiple rounds of imaging. And one question we might have is, is the chemotherapy doing anything? Have we actually killed off the tumors? And we can't really tell that just by looking at an MRI. So here, okay, we can clearly see two lesions. Are they alive? Are they dead? What's going on? Well, we can use PET imaging, in this case, FDG PET, to tell. FDG PET is fluorodeoxyglucose. Notice that last word there, glucose. So this is a radioactive form of glucose. It's not metabolizable, but it can still be moved in through glucose transporters. So cells will pick it up. Just like any other glucose, they just don't do anything with it. The amount of FDG PET signal thus is related to the amount of glucose that's taken up. And the amount of glucose taken up is related to the amount of cellular activity. So if a cell's alive, it's going to pick up glucose. If it's active, it's going to pick up more glucose. And we can see here that lesion in the front, probably not alive, but the lesion in the back, clearly alive. And cancer cells have a very high metabolic rate, so they really light up with FDG PET. Moving on to infection of the nervous system, we have meningitis and encephalitis. If it's an emergency, always CT. If it's not an emergency, MRI is better. It will give you better resolution. So here we're looking at T1 MRI without on the left and with contrast. We want to apply the contrast agent to see where do we have signs of inflammation. On the left, everything looks fairly normal, but on the right we can see clear signs of enhancement. But where is it occurring? Is it in the meninges or is it more in the spinal cord and brain? In this case, it's in the meninges, so we're dealing with good old meningitis. If it were encephalitis, then we would see enhancement within the brain tissue, not in the meninges. For multiple sclerosis, we're going to use MRI, no doubt. CT is not going to have the resolution to work, and as a rule, we're going to have follow-up imaging just like in cancer. So, MRI, we need better resolution and we need to take a bunch of images. So, here on the left, we're looking at T1 MRI. You can see a little bit of hypo-intense lesions there, but have a look in the middle. T2 MRI, now the lesions pop. We can see pathology much better with T2 MRI. And for multiple sclerosis, we're going to be imaging across time. So on the far right here, we're looking at just four different levels of the MRI scan, but over time. So each image is a week. So you can see uh, across about 50 weeks or so, so almost a year, we can see the uh, emergence and the disappearance of these T2 uh, hyperintense lesions. And that's showing us the uh, waxing and waning of symptoms that it's typical with multiple sclerosis. So for dementia, here mostly what we're going to do is use CT first and then MRI to rule out potential causes of the cognitive dysfunction. Are we seeing signs of multiple strokes or, or perhaps some sort of tumor? Is there anything to suggest that there's an organic cause of the cognitive dysfunction that maybe we should address? Or 
is there no clear sign, there's no sign of stroke, no sign of brain tumor. Instead, we're likely dealing with a true case of neurocognitive dysfunction. So that's the, the use of CT and MRI to rule out dementia that has an organic basis from dementia that doesn't have a clear organic basis. More recently, people have developed uh, potential means of distinguishing the different types of dementia using PET imaging. With PET imaging, again, we're picking out the presence of specific proteins. And so we can compare the relative abundance of a couple different proteins and make a slightly more educated guess as to what type of dementia we're dealing with. For example, Alzheimer's disease is characterized by the production of plaques and tangles, collectively called amyloid. We have a PET ligand called Pittsburgh compound B, or PIB, that sticks into amyloid. So if you look on the top here, you're looking at PIB signals. PIB intensity is most intense in Alzheimer's disease. We should see a lot of amyloid as a rule. In fact, that's what we see on the top left. That's a case of Alzheimer's disease. In this patient, a whole lot of amyloid. But what we don't see, let's look on the bottom, is the loss of dopamine neurons. In this case, they're using a PET ligand that sticks to the vesicular monoamine transporter. That's the protein that packs dopamine into vesicles. So, if you have a loss of dopamine neurons, you have a loss of VMAT2. If we look in the AD column, column A there, we see a lot of amyloid, but we don't see signs of dopamine neuron loss. That's going to lead us toward Alzheimer's disease as the diagnosis. In the middle, panel B, we got dementia with Lewy bodies. We should see some amyloid, and it should be concentrated not so much in the cortex, but more in the brain stem. It should start in the medulla and work its way up into the midbrain. So we should see some uh, amyloid. But what we should also see is the loss of dopamine neurons. We should see profound dopamine neuron loss. So we might see a little bit of PIB, not so much in the cortex. That'll help us distinguish dementia with Lewy bodies from Alzheimer's disease. But the big thing here is that loss of dopamine neurons. So in panel B, not a whole heck of a lot of PIB, a little bit, kind of around the brainstem, and profound loss of dopamine neurons. This is clearly different from Alzheimer's disease. And that fits more with dementia with Lewy bodies. Frontotemporal lobe dementia, you don't see a lot of amyloid, and you don't see a lot of dopamine neuron loss. So using PET imaging, we might be able to tease apart the different types of dementias, and it could make some difference. We have slightly different treatments for Alzheimer's disease versus dementia with Lewy bodies, but we don't have anything to cure any of them. This can certainly help guide medication management, and that can delay for a bit some of the cognitive impairment, but it doesn't alter the course of the disease, so in the long run, cognitive decline is just the same no matter what you do medication-wise. Finally, we have Parkinson's disease. And this, we're going to do the same thing we've done in the, the previous slides. We're going to look for dopamine transporters. And that's what we see here. Not SPECT imaging, but PET imaging. So, uh, in this case, we have age match control on the left, Parkinson's patient on the right. Again, we're looking for that asymmetry because it tends to be more pronounced on one side than the other early on in the disease. And we can clearly see signs of that right our left, caudate, having hypo-intensity in the PD patient. Now, let's put all this together. And we'll go through a case example of how we use kind of many of these imaging modalities to look at structure and function and how that guides treatment. So, here we have a case, and it's a feller named Mr. A nice and specific. He's a 35-year-old man, or at least he was at the time. And he developed progressive worsening intrusive thoughts, insomnia, and mood symptoms, having both depressive and manic components. He also developed some uh, intrusive, um, not hallucinations, but whenever he would close his eyes, he would see 
a, a knife rapidly chopping pizza or stabbing a teddy bear. Okay, so the first thing they did, of course, was give him a whole bunch of drugs. So he got some antipsychotics, some benzodiazepine, some non-benzodiazepine, GABA agonist. Those didn't work, so they gave him some more benzodiazepine, some SSRIs. That didn't work either, so they thought, okay, maybe this has an organic basis. Let's send him off for imaging. And here we are on this slide. There's the CT scan. Quick and dirty. This wasn't an emergency. I don't know why they did the CT scan. Maybe they just like giving people some potentially fatal doses of radiation because it looks normal. Okay, well, let's go to the MRI. I don't know why they didn't start there, but who knows? Let's move on to the MRI. So we got T1 MRI without contrast on the left, with contrast on the right. So what we can see here is a non-enhancing hypo-intensity on the patient's right, our left. I know it's a little hard to see. So let's have a look at the T2 MRI. That's much better at looking at pathology. Hey, there it is. Look at that. Now you can see it. So we've got T2 on the left, T2 flare on the right. T2 flare, much easier to see the pathology because we get rid of all the free fluid. Okay, so clearly we're seeing uh, that, that T1 non-enhancing hypo-intensity, that T2 hyper-intensity. What this should be telling us is that we have some kind of um, inflammation, some kind of damage in the right pre-central gyrus, that's where it localized to, but it doesn't enhance, meaning the blood-brain barrier is okay. So this is likely some kind of early uh, tumorogenesis, all right? So right pre-central gyrus, okay, we should all remember what the pre-central gyrus is. This is one of the few brain regions that you need to know. It's your primary motor cortex. This thing's fairly important for moving us around. Now, the good news is it's on the right side, so it controls the left side of the body. Assuming Mr. A is right-handed, who needs a left hand? This is in the hand region. Well, most people like to have both hands. So, to confirm the diagnosis, what they did was take a biopsy, and they did indeed find abnormal cells, which they called a grade 2 or 3 astrocytoma. Unfortunately, because it's in the right precentral gyrus, the first neurosurgery team said this is inoperable because of risk of lifelong motor deficits in the left hand. A second opinion was obtained, and they did an fMRI. So here's where we're now putting structure and function together. So they did an fMRI, and I know I said fMRI is unreliable, except for localizing primary sensory and motor cortices. It's pretty darn good at that job. And here's what we see. This should blow your minds. The left, I'm sorry, the right primary motor cortex should control the left hand. So if we ask them to tap their fingers or clench their hand, what we should see is the right side of the brain being far more active. They saw the opposite of that. When tapping the fingers in the left hand or clenching the left hand, the left precentral gyrus was far more active. Over time, the activity in the damaged right precentral gyrus shifted over to the left. This is an amazing exception to the contralateral innervation. The brain is amazingly adaptive. So when the tumor developed and started destroying the uh, right primary motor cortex, the left primary motor cortex was somehow able to pick up the slack. So the second neurosurgery team decided it was operable because the motor function had migrated. So with that functional map in hand, the second neurosurgical team decided that the tumor was operable and they proceeded. The surgery was successful and Mr. A developed only minimal coordination and strength difficulties immediately post-operatively. They discharged him, and then he was hit by a bus. I'm kidding. Uh, he recovered within a few months. After about 18 months, they tapered off all the psychiatric medications that they gave him.
and that was the last they heard of him. That's about as happy of an ending as you can expect in the case of a grade 2 or 3 astrocytoma. Speaking of happy endings, we're done. If you have any questions for me, you can of course send me an email or drop by my office. I'm happy to chat about this stuff all day. See you later.